My name is Michael Godek. I'm with um, ThoughtWorks. I, I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, ThoughtWorks is based in Chicago and uh, has offices in 16 countries around the world. Um, and it's a software delivery company, right? ThoughtWorks delivers software. And uh, I'm co-presenting with um, Mike Manitsky. Uh, I'm Mike Manetsky. I'm the director of technology at Four Kitchens. Uh, we're a small but mighty uh, web development shop in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, famous for such things as press flow uh, and um, uh, doing the economist migration. So, yeah. so uh, welcome aboard. We're um, uh, the the hashtag for this conference is or this session is uh, Go for CD, which is up on the it's up on the bottom part of every slide coming through. That's uh, G-O-F-O-R-C-D. So if you could um, uh, tweet any questions as your question, questions and comments um, as we go along, and then we'll take, uh, we'll, we should have time for, for uh, questions and discussions um, towards the end. There should be plenty of time for that. So if you could push some uh, material out there to, as we go along, um, that will be helpful. It's, uh, it, this session is going to be fast, kind of dense. Um, I'm just going to have to assume a lot of stuff because we just can't explain really all the context, right? We're going to it's we're going to assume that um, you know about Drush and you know about how to you know something about building and delivering software, and um, we want to take you to the really good stuff. So we'll move really fast, um, and so where I'll definitely leave you in places missing certain context just because the field is so broad. So um, wherever you feel like you're missing context from uh, any part of the presentation, then um, again, ask a question on Twitter about it and we can talk about it and come to me afterwards. Let's have more discussion. Um, this is a big topic, so there's, uh, there really is a lot to, um, a lot to cover with it. Um, and then to promote it, actually, there's, we're going to give away, um, uh, most importantly, a, a copy of this book to someone here in this room um, th at the end of the session. This is Jez Humble's uh, book. on. Con it's really the seminal book on continuous delivery. It's a really, really cool book. This is one of the best books you can read in software development today. Um, and so it's based on whoever promotes, it has the most interesting tweet coming out, tweet question or comment, whatever it is. Uh, we're also giving away a copy of uh, the ThoughtWork and Th ThoughtWorks Anthology, which is a series of essays on software development, which is really actually pretty good. And then, you know, if you have kids, this is a really good one, right? This is uh, Kermit the, Fo the Frog. It's not easy being green because it, once you get into continuous delivery, your life becomes this thing of watching these pipelines, which either break and turn red or succeed and turn green. And... It's really true. It's not easy being green. <laughs> um, there's also um, two sets of these posters on continuous delivery that also we're going to give away. So there's like five people are going to walk out here for something. They're very cool posters. They, they are Creative Commons, and you can find these out on the Internet and make your own if you want. And the, So they're, they're an interesting study in and of themselves. To, to just walk through, spend time looking at what that what the what the information that's on those posters, All right? Also, um, the there's session notes at the URL that's listed down here: thoughtworks.com insights blog, DrupalCon Austin. And they're because we gave the session in Austin, and the same session notes are there. And in those session notes, there's a there's really a reading list that, and if you work through that reading list, about there's like. Martin Fowler's original article on continuous integration, the, uh, the case for continuous delivery, the history of this product, where it came from, um, uh, uh, links to some primers and other tools that would be interesting in this. So um, those session notes have a lot of valuable resources for following up from this session. Hopefully some of you will go away from here like at doing this stuff, right? Maybe you already are. So enough said, right? Let's go. So um, so here we are. You know, this session is about build automation tools. But in, the, in order to understand how to use these tools, we need to talk about why we use them. And build automation is a component of a practice called continuous delivery, or CD. 
So we need to have some context um, of the, pro the kind of problems that CD intends to solve. So the definitive resource on continuous delivery is Jez Humble and David Fairley's book, Continuous Delivery. And in the introduction of that book, they look to the industrial consultant Edward Deming, whose work in the 1970s, right, went back when Jimmy Carter was president, introducing the Japanese method to um, American plant managers, revolutionized thinking about the manufacturing process. And Jez writes in Continuous Delivery that Deming's work is the foundation of CD practice and software today. So we're going to start off with the opening paragraphs, the very first paragraphs from Deming's 1985 book, uh, Quality and Competitive Position, because it sets exactly the right context to understand why we value build software build pipelines. So here's uh, Deming. The aim of this book is to illustrate with simple examples that productivity increases with the improvement of quality. Low quality means high cost and loss of competitive position. Some folklore. Legend has it in America that quality and, pro and production are incompatible, that you can't have both. A plant manager will usually tell you that it's either or. In his experience, if he pushes quality, he falls behind in production. If he pushes production, quality suffers. This will be his experience when he knows not what quality is, nor how to achieve it. A clear, concise answer came forth in a meeting with 22 production workers in response to my question, why is it that productivity increases as quality improves? Less rework. There's no better answer. These people know how important quality is to their jobs. They know that quality is achieved by improvement of the process. Improvement of the process increases uniformity of output of product, reduces rework and mistakes, re re reduces waste of manpower, machine time, and materials, and thus increases output with less effort. Other benefits of improved quality are lower costs, better competitive position, and happier people on the job and more jobs through better competitive position at the company. These are some of the lessons that management must learn and act on. Uh, reduction of waste transfers man hours and machine hours from the manufacturer of defectives into the manufacturer of additional good product. In effect, the capacity of a production line is increased. The benefits of better quality through improvement of the process are thus not just better quality and the long-range improvement of market position that goes along with it, but also greater productivity and much better profit as well. Improved morale of the workforce is another gain. They now see that management is making some effort themselves and not blaming all faults on the production workers." End quote. And so that was that last part was the one that really nailed me because I spent I've spent most of my career in in um, in IT shops where effectively in the end when we pushed broken software they were blaming us right they're blaming the dev or the QA or whatever and it's it, it's really about the pro it's more about the process than it is the um, uh, the the skills of the well it's about everything but the process is a lot to do with it. So a key measure of what we're trying to achieve in our use of build automation tools is to have our team spend less of their time fixing things, i.e. rework, and more of their time available for new stories. There are other goals and measures, for example, uh, making the decision to release a business decision instead of a technical one. Uh, that's to say, when, you, when the stakeholders determine that a particular release candidate plays the stories they want to see go live, then you shouldn't have to go back to the devs and ask, is it really ready? or ask them for time to actually do the release because at that point the release to production should be a click of the button with rollback options similarly simple. Taking the risk out of release is a fundamental objective of con continuous delivery. That's one of the things we're trying to get done. In that sense, all of the effort of build automation is like a musician's rehearsal, right? When it comes time to walk out on stage, uh, the technical issues should be resolved. Um, an automated build pipeline is where your team rehearses for consistently successful deliveries. So um, the rest of the session is focused on the stuff devs love, um, but don't lose sight of the bigger picture and the, really the ultimate measure, right? The effort that you're putting in to build automation, is it resulting into more frequent deliveries with less rework? If so, then it's something that you can definitely make a 
it will be profitable to do. If you're not getting more frequent deliveries with less rework, then you have to question whether you're actually, what you're doing is actually useful because you have to find some metric to determine whether it's um, worthwhile. Uh, the benefits to large, high-risk projects are pretty obvious for doing this kind of stuff. But agencies that do a lot of small, one-off projects benefit from continuous delivery practices as well, especially in reducing risk associated with delivering changes to projects where there isn't any budget left, really, to fix things when they go wrong. So if you can get a solid delivery pipeline underneath this stuff, then um, you can um, uh, control your costs effectively. So um, just to keep things in context, continuous delivery builds on agile and DevOps practices. So it's an extension of those things. Um, if you don't already have, if you don't already automate infrastructure, which is not what we're talking about specifically here, you should probably do that first. And so before we dive into the, into this material, we're going to take a step back and talk really on the context of what DevOps is, which is this, like, the foundation underneath all of this. Okay. So um, so how does this all fit with DevOps, and what is DevOps? Um, so uh, in uh, the first line of Wikipedia on what is DevOps is it's a uh, point of view of uh, development and operations. So it's a, just a combination of those words. Um, and that actually speaks volumes as to what it really is. Um, it was started out more as a cultural movement, similar to Agile, rather than a technical movement. Um, and it was a, uh, an, uh, a need to increase collaboration between operations um, and uh, development teams. Uh, the problem was, and the problem still is in many organizations today, is that uh, uh, developers want to get project uh, new features out as fast as possible. And the operations team has the uh, almost always opposite task of making sure that uh, the uh, existing uh, features are working correctly, right? Mm -hmm. So, bo bo so it's no uh, it's no surprise that th those two organizations would butt heads very frequently. Um, the word has really grown into a uh, a much bigger sort of broad term. It's gr grown into a job title. Um, which you know, people, a lot of people in the DevOps community complain about and sort of find uh, uh, wrong-headed. Um, but um, at you know, uh, you can say the same things about agile, right? Um, you know, agile has become a buzzword. Agile, is, everybody's doing it, um, and you know, uh, if you know, uh, um, but and everybody says that everybody else is doing it wrong, right? Um, the real, uh, um, but. That that doesn't that doesn't make agile less useful. Um, just the fact that it's uh, you know that um, uh, the the word uh, has grown to mean more than it, it had been intended to. Uh, the same is true for DevOps, and a lot of the principles that make um, DevOps important for organizations, um, uh, big enterprise organizations and big software projects, really apply also to um, uh, making the lives of all developers better. So some of those pr principles that sort of that that, that came out of that um, are um, configuration of, uh, as code, um, automation, and uh, metrics for everything, and then finally continuous delivery. So configuration as code. Um, so this is the really the, the, the first step in sort of um, uh, in, in automation. Uh, because how many people here have uh, pushed a release uh, that worked perfectly locally, uh, but on pr uh, on the production, you know, completely blew up and didn't work at all, right? And that was because of some very small uh, difference in uh, minor version, uh, you know, of some library um, or PHP or something like that. Um, so, uh, and we've we've solved that problem on the code level, um, and you know, everybody here, I hope. Um, is using source code management to manage their um, their software development. Um, it's uh, becoming increasingly um, uh, common, but still very new for lots of people. The the idea of putting their servers into source source control um, and uh, 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 and storing those configurations in a way that is repeatable, um, automatable, um, and sort of fits into a continu t continuous delivery pipeline. In Drupal, we have uh, hold on, almost there. Um, so in Drupal, we have like it. Oh. There's another step before 
um, even uh, uh, sort of taking our configuration, the server configuration, it's our Drupal configuration that we need to be able to um, uh, uh, to put into code. And so really the first step for, for, uh, for anybody working with Drupal is to start using features um, and start using to, um, uh, update hooks. Um, so features has sort of become a thing. Um, but um, so how many people use features actually? Great question. All right. How many people uh, uh, include modules uh, or enable modules in update hooks? Okay, much fewer. So uh, that's the, so people using features but then still sort of deploying stuff by hand. Um, really, what you want to, the point that you want to try to get to is, is the ability to, uh, uh, um, to not have to do anything on production once you push code, just <coughs> run update.php. Um, it's not as hard as it seems and it, it's really worth it. So, um, and how does that relate to the, you know, to the quote from earlier? Uh, uh, less, um, uh, eliminating those differences between different environments um, means that you don't have to um, uh, fix bugs between them. If it works locally, you can then, if you know that those two environments and you can prove that those two environments are the same, um, you can confidently push code uh, forward and know that, it, that it's going to work in both environments, right? So the next step is, like, y once you have the ability to, to, um, uh, to automate things is, of course, automating the things. So um, uh, uh, an important thing to think about when you're thinking about automation is that it may take, um, it may take a week to automate something that takes five minutes every week. And on the surface, it seems like that's not worth it, right? But when you, um, uh, when you factor in the time that it takes to unfuck the one time that you uh, wrote that incorrectly uh, or did those steps incorrectly, um, it's going it, to, that will increase your, uh, 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 and factor that in, plus factor in the client management time to, um, uh, uh, to calm them down after breaking the site. Um, then factor in the time needed to have a couple drinks to forget about how bad of a day that was, um, suddenly that equation gets turned on its head and it becomes worth it to, to be able to uh, automate that five minute task, right? So it's not about automating for speed, it's, it's, it's for reproducibility. Um, and again, to reduce the amount of rework. So the next thing is metrics and measuring. Um, so at this point you have automated builds and they're going out. Um, if you are, um, if you're kind of just following along and this is your process that you're building out your, um, uh, your, your, your environment, um, you're right now in an extremely dangerous state. Um, uh, and so one of my uh, uh, colleague of mine who works at, 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 at Chef, one of the uh, automation tool builders, um, uh, he has a great quote um, and it's uh, that uh, um, anybody can, uh, 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 anybody can make, make mistakes uh, but to really screw something up, you need automation. Um, because um, at this point, you know, you can push something to production without uh, completely hands off, there's a button you press, um, but you don't necessarily know if, the, uh, if what you did actually worked. Um, you're trusting that those environments are the same, but you know, everybody, the, 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 um, and that your functional test was, um, uh, uh, was good, but did you really check every page in the site and things like that? Um, and is there, are there uh, uh, performance problems that have crept in? Um, if you don't have metrics, if you're not measuring how things are working, um, then you don't know whether what you're doing is actually working. Um, the other, uh, and it's not, not just collecting that data, it's presenting and providing that data um, to people who can uh, uh, um, uh, take action on it. So it's not enough just to have, you know, I mean, you, the errors are probably being logged, right? But how many people here have a vi visualization of the number of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of notices and whether they increased or decreased, um, uh, you know, with a build, or the number of errors that have started to creep up in production? Um, if you can start looking at that and knowing where those errors crept in, um, you can catch problems with the uh, with the build that um, uh, that haven't built up yet, because a lot of times it's it's, it's it, uh, uh, performance problems come in two different uh, varieties, right? Ones that have, uh, you know, you've just a, a big problem, somebody wrote a really long query. But most of the time, those problems come from um, different things being combined uh, to uh, uh, small little problems building up on top of each other. So uh, finally, that's where we get to continuous delivery. Um, and this includes other ideas such as um, automated testing, continuous integration, and continuous deployment. Um, in big organizations, big software projects, those, the amount of time that it takes to 
um, set up those pipelines and set up those those processes um, are really really easy to um, uh, uh, to justify. Uh, but for a small shop, those kinds of uh, those kinds of uh, it, it doesn't need to be a, a full dive. Um, doing any one of these things is going to bring you closer to um, uh, to greater productivity than uh, doing all of them. Um, automated testing is a great uh, case where if you do too much of it, um, you can actually slow down your whole um, uh, uh, production pipeline because you have developers sitting around waiting for tests to run instead of writing uh, new features. So it's finding a balance um, and writing one test is better than writing all the tests. Automating all the way up to staging and then you know having manual steps to go from staging is better than um, uh, than starting from from uh, from scratch. So. Um, it's uh, the, the, the final steps are being able to um, uh, see that, uh, visualize that pipeline and see how it's all working. Um, and that's where, uh, uh, that's where Go start com comes into this. Um, and uh, finally, the, the most, like the, this all like ties back to um, Agile in that the highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So, Taking all that stuff and putting it all, uh, putting all, putting all the effort into continuous delivery, is really one of the th one of the things that enables agile. Um, so it takes work outside of the project to make the project be able to move fast and um, uh, and produce features. Cool. So let's 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 dive into the product, right? Or dr dive into the tool. Let's let's see if we can build some stuff. Um, so. Um, Again, t continuous delivery comes right out of this first statement of the Agile uh, Manifesto, right? 2001, um, the, the practice is just uh, an extension of it. Um, and this tool that we're looking at, uh, Go, started in 2000. Uh, ThoughtWorks produced um, Cruise Control, which we think is the first um, modern CI tool that was made. And uh, Cruise Control was open source product. I guess it's still kicking around somewhere. but. In around 2008 or 9, uh, Jez Humble, who was a thought worker then, he's at Chef now, um, uh, led the team that rewrote Cruise Control into Go. And then it was a uh, licensed product of ThoughtWorks Studios for enterprise continuous delivery up until um, this year. And at this point, it was like the, um, the, the desire to uh, advocate for software excellence by um, building a community for continuous delivery was really more important than having a product, right? So it, it made sense to open source this thing and let's just use it. Um, that's where it came from. There's more in the history on it. Oh, we'll get, let's just go into the product, right? So, um, you know, like Jenkins, uh, Go consists of a server managing many agents. And probably the most important distinction is that um, a pipeline is a first-class object in Go. Go servers your interface to the agents where you can uh, configure and monitor your build pipelines. Um, uh, Go agents get the job done, right? The agents are actually the ones that are doing the job. Jenkins has this master-only mode that lets you run agents from the server. Um, but in, with Go, you're always using agents. You have the server and you have the agents out there doing work. Um, Go has a number of uh, really important features baked right in, such as trusted artifacts and uh, fan and support that you'd have to build out with plugins and glue code if you wanted to do something like that with Jenkins. Um, with Go, you can deploy any version that you've previously deployed, again, at any time, very easily. Um, Go really stands out when you get into modeling complex, work complex workflows and managing dependencies between software builds. So, say for example, you have a bunch of house custom modules that get included in most of your sites. And you can model the dependencies in Go so that all of your products that include those modules get automatically rebuilt when code get, gets committed to any one of them. So when a developer making changes, they're likely working on one story for a client and they, mi they may miss how their, um, their change breaks other projects that they're not actually working on that depend on the same code. And so surfacing the break in the dependent projects really close to the time of commit rather than like weeks or maybe months later when that other project gets a change, uh, that's a really a huge benefit to quality and productivity. 
Um, Go really has a lot of nice end-to-end -end visualization and auditing features, such as a build compare view, where you can diff both commit messages and the actual files between any two arbitrary builds, so that if something goes off in production, then you can really quickly identify the sources of the change uh, looking at this interface in the tool. Uh, some of the things that you get as in Go as like first class built-in concepts are the ability to trigger a pipeline as a unit, um, the, to make one pipeline depend on another, to make artifacts flow through a pipeline, to have access control at the pipeline level, to associate pipelines with environments, and to um, compare changes between pipelines, right? Um, so I think those will um, make more sense as we go forward. So. Here are um, six concepts we're going to go through in the next 20 minutes, right? What are build materials and how you declare them? How to set up build stages? Um, how to set up jobs for each build stage? How to match agents to run the jobs? How to configure tasks for agents to execute? And what are build artifacts and how you use them? So with those six concepts, you'll be ready to go. So. A key takeaway from the session is like getting the idea of what a, real, a build pipeline is really all about. So here's a quote from Martin Fowler, who's chief scientist at ThoughtWorks, on the concept of a uh, build pipeline. I can't do the British accent, so. Um, but it's one of the challenges of an automated build and test environment is you want your build to be fast so that you can get fast feedback, but comprehensive tests take a long time. A deployment pipeline is a way to deal with this by breaking up your build into stages. Each stage provides increasing confidence, usually at the cost of extra time. Early stages can find the most problems, yielding faster feedback, while later stages provide slower, more thorough probing. Deployment pipelines are a central part of continuous delivery. So um, increasing confidence as you go forward is a really, really big part of what you're trying. It's a, one of the values you get pulling out of this. Um, so some of the other features we're kind of looking for out of our build pipeline are um, uh, running our automated tests before we cut over a build so that when, a, when, uh, when, a, when the test fail, then we don't have to look at the, re the results. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't trash the environment going forward. Uh, having a pre being able to release into production and preview it before you actually cut it over, very very nice in terms of building confidence. Zero downtime release, um, really simple rollbacks is a fundamental principle of continuous delivery. Taking the risk out of delivery is one of the things we're after in this. Um, you can achieve it in different ways, but that's essentially the goal. Um, another key takeaway, hopefully, will be to understand the distinction between build materials and build artifacts. Right. Build materials are the ingredients going into your recipe, typically uh, source code and binaries. Uh, artifacts are the cupcakes that come out of the oven, you know, because you're always tinkering with the recipe, so no two batches are really actually going to be the same. And so trusted artifacts allow you to have these contractually consistent cupcakes within the context of a single build pipeline. Um, for our Drupal build, uh, like in the Java world, a trusted artifact will be the binary that's the production of the compilation that you do only once in a pipeline. You'd never compile something twice. Um, for a Drupal build, probably uh, for us, our cupcake is the database that we're producing as a product of the build, not what we're pushing into it, but the product of the build. That's our cupcake. So we'll come back to that in a minute. So uh, declaring your build materials is the foundation of your pipeline. So this is where you start out. Go supports a number of version control systems, including Git. Um, once your materials or your build materials are declared, which means telling Git Go where your source code is, Go Server will pull these resources, those repositories, and automatically kick off a build in response to a change or in response to a commit. And Go agents will take care of pulling the source code when the pipeline actually runs. So now you've kind of getting to the foundation of having continuous integration. Um, to have a new build kick off automatically whenever your materials change, you just tick off this automatic pipeline scheduling checkbox in the pipeline general options dialog, and um, you're just telling Go where your source code is, and um, and now you've got CI, or you're you're getting there. 
So let's talk about build stages. Um, a pipeline is essentially a container for stages. Um, there are, here's the set of stages we're using. We use uh, commit, QA, showcase, and production. That's the way our code flows. And maybe you call them something else or you'd have more of them or less of them, but that, um, whatever works, it's your pipeline. Uh, before we built our Go pipeline, when we were deploying with Drush and Bash scripts, a really common kind of anti-pattern was this conversation we'd have with devs, especially like on a distributed team, and um, about what was on each build. We'd have these conversations, right? What's on QA? Is this is this ta is this been on QA? Is not on QA? Devs were testing for things on QA where the devs knew were broken, and so. When we got our stuff into the pipeline, it really brought a level of stability to the team, and it increased everybody's confidence that they knew um, that what they were looking at was what it is that they thought they were looking at. It really was a it was nice change. So here are our stages built in Go, right? The commit stage is going to kick off automatically based on that pipeline general options settings we did earlier. So the trigger type that you see here doesn't matter for that first stage. But the on success trigger type indicates that the QA stage and the showcase stage, they're automatically going to kick off as long as the previous stage doesn't fail. So in this example, and typically, the production only gets built when we kick it off manually. If you set production to on success as well, now you have continuous deployment as opposed to continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is a practice. Continuous deployment is a point where you get to where you know, if you commit code and it passes all your your test coverage, then it automatically goes to production. And we do that for static HTML help files for product help. If it if the commit um, if if it passes a link checker, then we just automatically deploy it, right? Because that's the only thing that we think can break with that. But for software, we do more. We do things manually to production. Um, but your you know your pipeline stages aren't going to correspond probably one to one to release instances, right? So the di disambiguation of terms, right? So um, what your team thinks is a stage is this thing of commit, QA, showcase production, we'll start calling them release, they're the release instances, these VMs, right? And what we're doing is we have actually three pipeline stages for each release instance. One stage to build the system, another stage to test it, and a third stage to release it, breaking it up. And by separating the automated tests into a separate stage, then we can rerun the test without rerunning the build, right? It's pretty straightforward. And by having the release its own phase, then, well, it gives us a lot of, it, it gives you a lot more flexibility in manage, managing things overall. It, it puts you in control. Um, so here's the stack of three stages for each of four release instances, right? So now we have this pipeline that's got these 12 stages as you run, the stuff runs through, right? Um, so let's drill down into one of the stages so we can actually see something. Um, so here's the three stages in Go Server for the showcase instance. And the, the stages are containers for jobs. Um, jobs are what a agents actually run. And so the number that you see there on the right are the number of jobs in each stage. And we'll come back to that. Um, so, so far, we've looked at build materials, triggers, and stages. And now we're going to drill down into jobs, tasks, and artifacts. Um, but the review. Um, a pipeline is a container for stages. Stages are a container for jobs. Jobs in the same stage run in parallel. So they need to be functionally independent of one another. All right, no dependencies between jobs. All jobs need to succeed in order for the stage to succeed. To run a job, uh, Go Server finds uh, some agent that's suitable to run the job, and it hands it off to the agent to execute. So the agent typically is out there on a VM somewhere away from Go Server, and Go Server matches the jobs to agents based on resources you define in the job, with those resources you define in the agent. Essentially, that just means you put in tags in the job, and you put the same tags in the agent. And then Go Server figures out that that's the that's the agent that you want to have run that job, so it's not that hard. Um, this view shows uh, two jobs in one stage, and so in our example, it's a Drupal website and a Drupal Commerce store, which are two separate builds that go into making uh, one site. That from the end user perspective, it's like one website. Um, the two sites they they have like common header and footer. They're themed the same. 
Uh, to the user, they seem like one site, but to the team, they're two separate dependent code bases. And so when a commit is pushed into either code base, we have Go rebuild both projects in parallel with some automated tests that validate that the interface between the two sites actually works the way we expect it to. So it's one pipeline, two jobs. Um, so here's the agent view in Go server. So when you, you install an agent out on a VM and you tell, when you do that installation on the VM, you tell the agent where the server is, right? And the agent goes and registers itself back up to the server and it shows up in the list here, right? You don't have to do anything else. And then it's just the, uh, the tag matching is what's highlighted on the right, right? So the same tags in the job, the same tags in the agent, and your, your job is running. It's not that hard. Um, if you have m multiple agents with the same tags as the job, then Go is just pick the first one it finds that is available to run it. If you have um, uh, two jobs that get called against and there's only one agent available, then Go will just run them in sequence, one after the other. Right, makes sense. So, um, okay, so if a pipeline's a container for stages and stages are a container for jobs, then probably it's no big surprise, right, that jobs are containers for tasks. A task is a command to be executed, so finally we're getting to where we're actually getting to do something, right? Setting up pipeline stages and jobs is effectively configuring the metadata of the pipeline, right, setting up the stage for the action that's gonna come, and that tasks are the action. So all the stuff, if you, do, if you do your deployment manually, building your pipeline is just like taking everything you would do one by one by one by one, putting them all in your tasks in the right sequence, and now you've got it automated, right? Um, so in this example, building our Drupal site is done in two tasks. The first task copies the appropriate property file over for the, for the target environment that we're actually in, because we have different settings for QA and showcase and production. And then the second task actually builds the site. So before we drill down to the tasks, let's take a look at these four meta concepts in a Go pipeline, right? Go has, they, they've carefully considered abstractions, providing tasks inside of jobs, inside of stages, inside of pipelines with a mix of, of parallel and serial, right? Pipelines run in parallel and jobs run in parallel. Stages and tasks run serial. And so this design in part was motivated by this Joel Splotsky's law of leaky abstractions, right? And here's Joe Splotsky. He says, to have powerful enough abstractions, the, the right ones, to make it possible to model your path to production effectively and more importantly, to model it to remodel it as you learn and evolve over time, while at the same time resist the temptation to continually introduce new unnecessary abstractions that are only going to make things more difficult in the long run because they will be leaky. All right? So when you try to, you know, you, you've, you've probably seen pipelines in Jenkins, right? But pipelines in Jenkins are like your own, everybody's own like abstractions of how you're stringing together a series of tasks, right? Go, it was designed from the ground up with this idea of the pipeline as a, as a first class object where you can, you can get your abstractions right. Okay, so we're back to tasks. Um, drilling down into the task configuration, right? So here's the dialog for configuring the copy command which was the first one of our tasks. You can see there's no big magic going on here, right? CP, right? You just tell Go agent what to do in the task, the same way you might on the command line. Uh, when you set, when you install the Go agent, you configured it to run as a particular user on whatever machine it's installed on, right? And so you need to make sure that the command you you're running is on the path for that user, or you put in the full path to the command, right? Should be. Um, also, the, the the Go user needs to have the agent user needs to have the rights to do what you're asking it to do. Um, each argument is, set, is specified on a separate line. So uh, if you did that on the command line, you'd say you'd CP write two um, parameters and here you're gonna break each one in a separate line. Uh, the working directory you see below is relative to the agent's home directory. So wherever the agent is installed, that's like ground zero for the, for the um, working directory. And so this is the scripts folder under the agent install. 
Um, the second task in our job is a Fing call to actually build the system. So Fing is Apache Ant for PHP. It's a target-based XML scripting language. And there's a link to a Lullabot primer that's very good on it in the uh, session notes, right? Uh, build systems are generally classified as either being target-based systems like uh, Ant and Fing or product-based systems like Maven and Make. Make is a product-based build system. Um, target-based systems are, like, they're easy to get started with, I think, and they, they tend to get hard to read as they grow in complexity because you've got all these, like, targets. It's hard to see how they all really all fit together. Um, Product-based systems uh, are kind of hard to debug. It's like all or, tend to be all or nothing, right? You run, either it makes it or it doesn't. And ad hoc reconfigurations are kind of are, are more difficult, right? With the target-based system, you can pull a target right out of the middle of it. You can run on the command line. Uh, you don't have to start at the beginning if you don't want to. Um, probably the best choice is you know, like the devil you know, whichever works. Um, uh, we chose Fing. Um, uh, Go is a tool for orchestrating your build, not for locking you into any one of particular tool, right? You use whichever tools that you want. And for example, if you already have Jenkins builds, uh, you don't have to re-implement them to put them in a Go pipeline, right? You can kick off a Jenkins build as a Go task and, and, the wrap, and essentially wrap existing Jenkins infrastructure inside a first-class pipeline, right? You don't have to start over to go do this. Um, so here's the task dialog for our Fing call, right, that when we're actually building the site. And the, so it's, we're giving the full path, user bin Fing is what's going to run. And the dash F is, says, you know, the file name is going to come next. The file we're calling is build.xml, which is the default in Fing. And then the Fing target is deploy dash dev. That's what is, they're going to, Fing is going to go look that up and build that XML and it's going to go do that, whatever that happens to be. And it's going to look in the scripts directory under where the agent is running. So let's drill down into that thing target, right? This is where it starts to get more fun. So here's the actual thing car target we're calling. Um, the target name there at the top is deploy dev, deploy dash dev. And uh, so that's our commit phase, the first phase of the, of the, build, of the pipeline. Um, the first line is a thing built in command that T stamp. And that initializes the thing date time variables, which then we use to uh, for the doc root and database name in the build. So every build gets its own doc root, its own database, and it's just timestamp named. We don't have to worry about it. Um, the main action here is the call to uh, deploy dash website target, which is the one that's highlighted there. So we'll drill down into that next. Um, the rest of this, the, the rest of the stuff in there is like uh, environment cleanup and setup, all, everything that needs to be done in the, you know, step by step all the way through the build, right? So here's the, um, this build website target, right? Now we're getting into like, now this is a Drupal site we're building, right? Um, the first lines copy source code from the Git repos where the Go agent is, manage, is managing it for us. So when the Go agent kicks off, right, it goes and pulls all your source code from the, from the Git repository, whatever your source repo is. It pulls in all the materials, and all the materials are sitting there stacked up like on a loading dock over by the agent, right? The agent's got them, and they've, you know, they're there. Um, it's sort of like the truck just comes to your home and offloads the building materials. And so here, we actually move the building material. We create the document route where the site's going to go. We move the source code, the, the Drupal site, into there. We deploy settings.php, all the stuff that needs to be done. Um, and then uh, we, when the code's in place, when the document route's in place, then we hand it off to Drush site install, right? So Drush is supported in Fing with a plugin called uh, drushtask.php. So Drush is not natively supported in Fing. You need to implement this plugin. Once you have this plugin, then, and obviously if you're doing Drupal sites, you're, you're going to put this plugin in and you're going to drive your build with Drush, right? So everything you're already doing manually or interactively or scripting with bash scripts, if you're using Drush, you just wrap them up here in Fing. And it's beautiful. So just to show you that, you know, like there's nothing up my sleeve here, right? Here's a drill down all the way to the Drush call, right? So it's, a, it's just the same thing you do in the command line. If you can do it in the shell, then you can do it as a go task, 
right? The rest of it is mostly a matter of paths and permissions, right? Permissions is kind of like a big, for me, it's been a, uh, it's a lot of work sometimes, making sure we have the permissions for everything right on the server. Um, so after this Drush site install returns, then uh, we have a series of targets that uh, we run through that enable the appropriate con uh, contrib and custom modules, build our menu blocks, taxonomies, views, blocks, users, permissions, um, as well as um, initially any content we've declared is like metadata for the site, uh, content that really needs to be in place for the most basic stories to play. We'll build a little bit of content out. If something, if you have content that is linked to a menu, then we'll build that content to make sure that we can test the menus, right, that kind of stuff. So Go tasks really are a wrapper for uh, Fing, in our case. You can use them other things. And Fing is a wrapper for Drush, right? You're all the way down to the ground now. So in the end, you know, this is, again, our, more our, the example and what we're doing in our build, right? We have, um, we, at the very end of the build, we deploy um, uh, Redis and varnish settings and clear the caches, right? Now we have our active site. And so just as like a, a digression, the, the Redis, uh, Redis cache settings and the Varnish VCL, you could manage them. You might, probably you might want to manage those in the server, not in the build, right? We put those files in the build so that they would go through the wash cycle every time if we made some little tweak to the Varnish VCL. Um, then it would go through the whole uh, testing stack. So if we accidentally broke something, we'd be more likely to maybe to catch it than on the configuration side. But... Um, but it is kind of server config configuration type files. So here's the interesting part, at least for the way we're doing it. Um, after we build the site, before we've written any configuration to the database, which is specific to the environment. So we're building QA, but we haven't written the VARs that really make that, that site QA specific. We take a database dump, which we then hand off to the Go server as an artifact. Um, we don't, we're not using database dumps of a way of delivering configuration content into the build. Um, that is, we don't use database dumps as build materials. Instead, we use database dumps as like a signed and sealed contract of what this particular pipeline run is about um, to make sure um, that, you know, once our cupcakes, the database dump, comes out of the oven, then every subsequent stage in the pipeline is guaranteed to get the same cupcakes, no questions asked. Um, so really, really, really builds in confidence. So let's walk through it to see how this stuff works, this part, right? So here's um, the artifacts tab in a Go and a job dialog. Um, we tell Go server about the cupcake, what its name and where to expect it to be when the job completes. And if it's not there at the end of the job, the job fails. Uh, when it's found, uh, Go server uploads it from whatever environment the agent ran on, wherever that happens to be, so that it's available to the, uh, any subsequent stage in the pipeline running on any other VM, right? So if you have get into complex scenarios where you have a lot of VMs that are out, it just doesn't matter where the Go agent is running. You don't have to keep track of where the file is or copy the file anywhere else because Go server just it's just wrapped up in Go server. It just takes care of it. Um, that particular database dump, that cupcake, is only going to be available in the context of the same build pipeline instance because each run of the pipeline gets its own cupcakes, right, baked to the, the, according to the recipe changes for that particular run. That's what the pipeline's about, right, is keeping track of, like, what your recipe is. So here we are on the task configuration for a job. Uh, on the following stage, right? We, we pulled the cupcake out of the oven in, in the commit stage. And then here uh, we set up a task to pull the cupcake back out of the pantry, right? And uh, Go server is going to fetch, fetch it from the previous stage and deliver it to whatever, whatever environment the um, agent executing the current job of QA is on stage is running on. Um, So here's a drill down into that fetch, fetch artifact configuration. Um, the empty pipeline field there tells Go server to look for the artifact in the current pipeline. So that gives you a clue that you can easily pass artifacts between pipelines as well as between stages. So you can build into some really cool, uh, very complex scenarios. 
if necessary. This is, we'll keep it simple. Uh, for now, we just want to reach back to the previous stage of the same pipeline, the one here called dev build. And then we're going to tell GoServer which job to look for, which is that um, build dev site. And then we're going to tell it which file to pull. And we, when we leave the destination blank, it tells Go server just to deliver the cupcake to the same directory as the current jobs agent, right? It's the same concept of the, uh, the doc group for the, um, for the agent, where the agent is running. So now you've got this distinction between build materials and build artifacts, right? Getting rid of the database as a build material, something getting, getting pushed into the build, it goes a very long way to getting total control over what you're delivering because now nothing is in there, nothing is in the database, nothing's in the build that we didn't explicitly put there. Um, you could do different hybrid strategies such as like, you know, you could do like a um, all encode delivery without content and then use like table selective database dumps or services or node import from JSON to deliver content. We were having this discussion like how do you, delivering content is is um, there's a, a lot of different ways that you could go about that. But the main point here is not our specific strategy of how we're doing that, but to emphasize the, really the considerable benefits of trusted artifacts in a delivery pipeline. It really, really um, uh, it smooths things, things out, and when things go wrong, you start debugging with a much higher confidence level, um, which helps find the problem faster. So finally, we'll walk through the schematics of our thing targets uh, for these four deployment stages. Because we're looking at this thing, we're looking at these targets from the perspective of, um, of Go server, right? Where you're, imp you're in, in the task, you, imp you call a particular thing target, which is going to do the work. And this is more like a call stack of what is happening inside thing. This is the part that's hard to do in thing, is to visualize actually the sequence of events because you've got this big XML. That's the problem with XML, right? You get this big XML file and it's got all these targets all over the place. And so it's helpful to do this kind of visualization of how the stuff works. Um, so the pink box at the top is deploy dev. That's what our Go task is calling, right? That's our target name. And the rest is the fin call stack to the completed through all the way through to completed site. So we get the end. We've got a website that's working, uh, hopefully working. Um, the white on white targets are mostly your DevOps type stuff, right? Uh, and the yellow on green targets are the Drupal site build. That's where we're doing this, this, the Drupal specific site. And so that's the part you'd organize your build into whatever set of targets that made sense for the way you wanted to go about building your Drupal site. You don't have to do an all encode site. However you're doing it, you're deploying somehow now, right? The question is just wrapping up how you are deploying it into a set of tasks that can be repeated. Um, the save database target there in the middle, um, that's where we pull the cupcake out of the oven, right? So uh, in this next stage, right, so that last call stack was for the commit stage, the first stage in the pipeline. So now we're looking at the similar call stack for the QA stage. Um, so the target is de deploy website QA stage. And um, this target is where we load the database artifact, fetch for us from Go, our, our little cupcake. We pull it back out of the pantry. And then we use that database dump to load into the site. So we're not repeating anything that was written into the database on the first stage. So we don't have to worry about, like, any. there's any possibility that we could write something differently. Um, we don't have to worry about what VM the devs had run on, if um, another dev build has run since then, which is, you know, like if you run dev and it creates a cupcake and you run another one, it creates another one, which one do you want? You want the one in the same pipeline all the way through. Because you can have multiple stacks of pipelines running simultaneously, right? You can have a pipeline running out that's like you're trying to get out to production. You can have others on top of it where you have stuff that's been committed after what you're trying to get to production, and you can still be running pipelines for that, right? And, and it all keeps it all separate. You don't have to worry about it too much. It's nice. So we're guaranteed to have exactly the same database as we had in the previous stage of the dev build, right? So the yellow and green target here is everything else we're going to do with to the database in the QA stage. So for us, what it means is getting the content in, right? So in the commit stage, we build the site so we can do the most basic level of testing that we can, right, to validate that the devs didn't break the code in some kind of obvious way. 
and then in, in, we, in the QA stage, then we load in all the content. So now we have a full-fledged site with, with whatever content that the QA people need to actually test the site in an, any kind of meaningful way. And automated tests that are different, right, more extensive. The tests on QA take a lot longer than the ones that run on the commit stage. And so since we're actually modifying the database here, um, we're going to push a new cupcake back up to GoServer so that the next stage showcase gets the next one down, right? Uh, so that's where we are here. Um, when we go to showcase, you'll notice right away there's no yellow and green targets. Showcase got QA's cupcake, and, you know, that's the end of the discussion. It doesn't matter if testers went on to QA instance and added and deleted nodes because the cupcake that we got to showcase got pulled out of the oven before the testers ever got to touch anything on it. It's very, very nice that way. It doesn't matter if devs go in and modify code on any of the servers. It just doesn't matter because uh, we always get the right thing on the right stage. Um, and so now when we go to production, well, it's exactly the same process as with Showcase. We just take the same cupcake from QA, that, and that's what we're going to deliver to production. It's a brand spanky new Docker root with its own database with no worries that somehow the recipe changed in any kind of way in the last stage. And when we're done um, building on the production stage, we have a completed site sitting out there on prod in a pre-release doc route available for inspection on a private URL so you can look at it before you cut over to it on production. And it's ready to co cut over simply by rewriting a sim link for current. We have a sim link to current that's, that the Apache V host looks at. and. So you just rewrite the sim link, and the site goes from being the old site to the new site. So you can imagine when you look at um, uh, rollback, you know, rollback's pretty easy. Rollback simply is a matter of rewriting the sim link, rewriting some sim links, right? That, that's all we have for rollback. You do have issues of, like, content that's being generated in, on live on the site, and so there's strategies we don't have time. There are strategies where you deal with all that stuff, too, but um, we don't, can't go there. So... Really, pipelines are for people, right? It's not just a dev thing. It has a lot to do with getting people from different parts of the organization to collaborate, right? Much of the waste of releasing software comes from its progress through testing and operations. And so we use build pipelines to solve this problem, to find and remove bottlenecks. And so we want to get rid of, like, inflexible monolithic scripts. We, want, we don't want to have any slow sequential testing. We, want, we don't want to have flat, simplistic workflows. And we don't want, like, one, uh, one tool to rule them all, right? We want to use whatever tools that we want to use to get this job done. And we pursue relentless automation to avoid accidental changes, to shorten the feedback loop, and to ensure repeatability. Build, really builds confidence. And finally, we value optimization and visualization to get people from different parts of the organization to collaborate in the timely delivery of useful software. We want, to build, we want to drag in the non-technical BAs, stakeholders, and drag them into this release process so it becomes their, the, the release process becomes a business decision, right? That once we get the stuff out on showcase, technical issues are resolved. It's a business decision whether the features that they're looking for are the, are the stuff that they want to see delivered in production. And if it is, then, we, then they just click the button and the stuff goes out there. This is the goal of continuous delivery. You don't have to get all the way there, but this is the path that we're all on. So, thank you. I, I think I burned a lot of the time here. Um, so we have like a couple minutes for questions, and I'll hang around, right? So, uh, do we have questions coming up? Yeah, there's quite a few actually. So you want to lead off here? Uh, yeah, sure. I guess the, the first one is the last one, which was uh, when deploying to a live site, uh, do you still use site install? Site install? Yeah. Drush, uh, no, site install. Site install is, yeah, we do, yeah, yeah, Drush site install, yes. Yeah, we start with, a z we, for us, we start with a zero database every time, and we build everything up from code. We do Drush site install, yeah, absolutely. Okay. We use Drush for everything we can. So, we do, okay, that, what we do is we, the, we, we build everything, we build the new site out on production, so it's sitting in a new document route right next to production, right? It's sim-linked as pre-release, so we can go look at it. When we actually click the 
the, the final stage of a release, then we SQL sync the uh, we put we put the um, production site into uh, maintenance mode, which the users generally don't see because everything's in varnish anyway. Almost everything is, and then we SQL sync any data that's um, that's uh, coming from the live site. We SQL sync it into the new site, and then we bring that and then we cut over the sim link. You know we're up, and the whole thing takes a couple of seconds, right? If you had more data, maybe it takes a 15 seconds, or I don't know what it, you know, but it's not very long. It's just, that's how we're doing it. It's SQL syncing the live data at the last, because that's the only way. You have to do it at the last minute, because the moment that you, you know, the last moment that you, before you put the site in maintenance mode, somebody could have committed a record, right? You have to get all of that. Uh, so next question, is there a way to reuse tasks or even jobs so you don't have to reconfigure e every pipeline from scratch? Templates. Yeah, you have um, uh, Go is, is, is a set behind that whole GUI of Go, it's all writing the stuff in XML. And so the real Go heavy-duty guys, they, they just go in and write, the, you know, write in XML instead of u even using the GUI. You can make templates and recreate you know, entire um, uh, uh, Go um, pipelines from the template, or you can copy XML from one task and paste it in another pipeline. Yes, all of that, no problem. Um, so the next one, in, in, in continuous delivery, do you use any other metric on deployment decision um, than whether or not unit slash behavior tests passed? Uh, there's a lot of emotional metrics that go in. <laughs> um, we're still, in, you know, we're in the path of discovery and all that kind of stuff. My view is that, um, that the BA, the business analyst, should have this responsibility not only for the decision to release to production but for maintaining the um, – the test suite in at that sh at that showcase stage, right? That the business analyst we should drag the business analyst in and say, "This is your test suite. You're the one that has to decide what has to be here," because that's the person that's really mapping requirements from the product owner back. But it's a pretty uh, that's uh, uh, what is it a fiery point, right? Whenever I talk about that question, like people, there's a lot of different opinions about how that's supposed to work. We don't do that. You know, for us, it's we basically rely on our tests, and if our tests don't break, we kind of look at it and we push the stuff out. Cool. And I think the the last question, unless I missed any, um, is: uh, uh, Do you have experience with big legacy cold bases, and uh, and how uh, would you migrate to to continuous delivery while minimizing problems during this um, transition? What was the first ex with? Uh, experience with big legacy co code bases and how to get those into CD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a lot of. Ex yes. I have. Yes. <laughs> I've been. More yeah. Than you'd want ever. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've got. Yeah. I've, I, that's why I'm in Drupal is because I escaped from big. You know, 20 years of big legacy corporate Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Windows, Oracle, SQL Server stuff like endless stuff. You should see what they have running at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, American Airlines is like, they've got this stuff that's still from the Pleistocene that's running out there. Um, they still run basic, you know. Uh, so I, bit by bit is the only way that you can do that, right? It's called, Martin Fowler calls it the strangulation pattern, right? It, it's really the only, uh, the only thing I can think of to do that, right? Because I, I've seen so many of these legacy projects, multi-million dollar, let's convert this legacy project, fail. I, I don't even, I can't even count them, you know, how many millions and millions of dollars of these projects, and they, they try to rewrite the stuff, and it's like the next team comes in and like, you know, we're going to rewrite this stuff, right? And then it's like two years, seven million dollars later, and it's like total failure, and they're gone, and it's the next team. So they just, you know, you, you have to, you have to, it, agile, right? You have to like figure out what's most important, you have to figure out something you can actually deliver and deliver it, right? That that that's a, that part. And the second part of the question was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. It's I mean the thing the thing that I've found in doing it, it actually is um, it's kind of there was a lot of pain in building this stuff out um, because while you're doing it, you're you're. It, it takes a lot longer to automate your stuff in a pipeline than it does to do it manually because manually you just kind of bull your way through 
Whereas in when you're building automation, then you have to like go through these. You have to just iterate through it, right? You have to like go through, and you you end up breaking further down the road, and you have to start from the beginning and go all the way through. I put a, I probably had the most time into permissions issues that I had a difficulty really getting my head straight around, right? What had to be in pseudoers and you know under which user and which place, and getting that all in Chef, you know, the infrastructure automation side of things. Um, but the again, the 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 key is to you know bite things off in the right size. Um, don't try to automate everything as a task. Just find some part of something that you can kind of get running, right? And and then you build on that. You try to find something that would actually be useful in some way, some part of the delivery, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to start. Obviously, if you're not doing anything, you're going to start with CI. You're going to build. You're going to do. You're just going to be building from commit every time a, you know, a commit gets pushed, and then write tests against that, against that, and then you'll do the rest of your deployment however you're doing it, right? Where you like move it to the next stage and then move it to production however you're going to do it, and so yet then you have CI that's running, and that's going to be your first step, and then the next part would be to try to do something for QA, right? To automatic, you know, push it out to QA, and then if you're still like got a manual production deployment process, then you just keep doing that until you get further out. Just bit by bit, one bit at a time, right? Don't stop, never give up, kind of thing. <laughs> it's really worth it, right? There's no, we're all going to be doing this because sooner or later, at some point, you're either doing this or you're dead, you know. Because the, you know, w once it once it becomes standard practice, right? That it, it like continuous delivery is the way thing, and it will be that. It is becoming that. It's kind of the beginning stages of of real actual implementation. But as you, uh, it, it becomes what people are really doing, then your competitive position is going to be really, really bad if you're uh, still putting all of this time into handcrafting your deployments, right? Because hand, the, the, to handcraft a deployment, you're using talent that's not cheap generally, right? This is expensive talent that's involved in this part of the process. So we did, there are two more questions. Uh, yep. The first one is, how do you manage large databases that take hours to dump slash restore? <laughs> uh, how do you, right? Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. There's not, I don't think there's any single answer to that. I mean, probably, um, uh, you know, the easy thing to say is, well, you know, maybe we should be looking at, like, document database and sharding or... So, so there, there's one thing that we like have started doing, um, which was uh, taking the database dump and restore outside of the build pipeline, um, so that instead of having so that there's a warm database um, ready for a new build. Um, so uh -huh. in one project, we're actually tailing it on to like after you do a build, the last thing that happens is another database um, uh, job gets kicked off, um, and then uh, we're also doing that on cron so that there's warm. Uh, databases for um, uh, that site builds are able to, to build on, so that's another kind of if you that's a if it's taking too long, see if you can take it uh, make it not serial. Right, doing things in parallel is like a big part of making because because the question goes to these feedback loops, right? You've got to get your build process and one way or the other, you've got to get it into something that you can live with in time, right? That's actually going to allow you to. Um, because when the build process, it's the same as with software delivery. If, you're, if your overall delivery cycle gets to be very large, um, then uh, it becomes a prob the time becomes a problem in itself, right? <laughs> we, at American Airlines, we did this thing where we said, we're not gonna we won't agree to do anything if we can't get it done in six months, right? So we had a shorter cycle. For what we're doing on our website now, we release one or two times every day. And by releasing every day or twice a day, or three times a day, that means that whenever we release something, we're just releasing like one thing. And so the risk becomes very, very low. So when you're dealing with, where you've got these kind of like large databases, that, that be, that's, you know, obviously that's an obstacle to the workflow, right? Because when something goes wrong and you have to repeat, now you're starting to get in trouble, right? When you have, when you have processes that are very, very long. So you just need to have some kind of, I don't know what the strategy, there's probably a lot of strategies for how it is that you can do that. I don't know if you could, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe you can put it back on the, you can do stuff on, this, on, on the, the database backend side and replication. 
Uh, maybe you can do your database dump in parallel where you, um, where you actually take one database and have four processes dump four different parts of it if you can figure out how to make that work, uh, right? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a NPM uh, uh, module um, that we built that does actually that too. So um, I can, uh, if somebody tweets at me, I'll figure out what, what the actual URL is for it. I literally forget the name of it right now. But uh, yeah, it does the very same thing. Um, it just uh, allows parallel um, uh, the database dumps to speed these things up because these are things that we run into all the time. So it's, a, it's a problem, but yeah, the, the warm builds actually makes a big difference. So th that's one of the things we're doing in, you know, in, in when, you're trying to, when you're trying to get to where you can say, you know, we're practicing CD. Uh, one of the things you're definitely doing is you're always on the hunt for bottlenecks, right, wherever that is. And that's your problem, right? That's the one, the bottleneck is what it is that you need to find some automation solution that's going to clear that. And when it's cleared, then, you know, you're on to the next, whatever the next problem is. And part, you know, a big part of the game is just making sure you do the right thing first, right? Because that's what allows you to keep working. It depends on, you know, whether you have support, whether you're trying to do this kind of thing as like a skunk work thing because you, you can't get support in an organization to do it or you've actually got a commitment on an organizational level that this is what you're going to be doing. Um, so last question yeah. uh, is uh, how do you handle continuous delivery if you have user-generated content or e-commerce transactions happening in production? Yeah, we actually do uh, this, this. What I demonstrated here, we do with our uh, e-commerce site. Um, it's not a heavy traffic site, yet, so it's not. we just sell software licenses. We don't get a lot of business on that, um, a lot of volume. But um, we do sequ we SQL sync, and so it's the same thing. We put the commerce site into maintenance mode. Uh, after, it's del after the new build is delivered, we put the commerce site in maintenance mode, and then we, um, we SQL sync all of the commerce tables from the previous production site, the going out production site, into the new target uh, production site. Obviously, we don't have varnish in front of that, so, um, you know, if somebody's in the store right at that time, they're going to get maintenance mode for as long as that takes, which, our, you know, our stuff is small, so it's just a couple of seconds. If you have a serious commerce site, obviously it's going to take more time. And so um, I, don't, I don't think that there's – I mean, there's a lot of the Internet as, is user-generated content. You know, commerce is user-generated content. Facebook is user-generated content, right? So a lot of it is. Uh, I don't know any other way to deal with it besides at the last moment, right? You bring it over. Yeah. Uh, are, are there any use cases where you have uh, a mess in the cloud and you take one out and you support the best one? And then you, uh, or maybe a few, and then you switch the load, load balancer to the new one? But some, somewhere you've got like a, a database instance that the second before you went into this process, the last second, somebody, you know, posted a payment, right? And so that record has got to be in your next production, one way or the other, right, wherever it is. You could do that. I, obviously, that's a, actually, it's a, it, that would be the next, obviously, really cool strategy is that you do exactly that, right? You, have, you bring up your new site without this, this updated data, right? And then after your new site is up, then immediately you have a process that goes back and figures out what you missed, and you do the SQL sync right after, right? And so that way you could do the zero downtime and you would get almost everything right, right? Whenever you do this stuff, it's hard to say that you're actually always going to get, yeah. you know. Right. Yeah, yeah and so how do you, and then how do you figure out when, yeah, putting the site in read-only mode is that, yeah. So you, the, the site's fully functional, they just can't proceed, right? And so then presumably in that case you wouldn't be breaking transact because then, you know, you, you know, this question of like what if you have a half-completed transaction and all that kind of, you know, that kind of problematic stuff. We just hope that we can kind of dance around that. But this stuff happens pretty fast, right? Really the kind of processes we're talking about for the kind of things we're talking about, it goes, um, you can do it, right? Zero, zero downtime releases, zero risk, very, very low risk. You know, on the on the releases, you know this this is where we're going to. It makes you feel a lot better on this stuff. And if something does go wrong, then the, again the confidence level that you go back into, right? That you go, 
I know that I know the infrastructure is all managed, right? So I know that this, this isn't a package issue. I know that this is the same database as we just finished all this testing on. I know that for a fact. I don't have to question that, right? And then I can you quickly go back in. You can diff the what the files between that came out, and it's like so. So it it burns out if you don't have this stuff, and something goes wrong. Then all of a sudden you're in this thing of like, you know, where do you begin? The process of figuring out what's wrong, and in regular development work, it, you, that's what we do all day long. We do that kind of stuff, but in production, you know, you, that's when I don't know about you, you know, it's like I sweat, and I've spent most, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I spent most of my career again doing these 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 really wild ass um, what look like now backwards, you know, of de deployments where we had no, you know nothing as a guarantee going forward. So um, in the order that you read off the questions, do we have – are we still here? Yeah. So uh, is uh, – Henry. Is that Henry? Yeah. LVN? Yeah. Are you still here? Yeah. Would you like a copy of – 